Russians. However, Adolf Hitler had a ready explanation for Stalin. With breathtaking audacity, he sent a message telling him that he had moved his troops to Poland to protect them from British bombers. By the beginning of June, the infantry divisions were in place close to the Soviet frontiers. Soon after, the motorized units and armored divisions, the spearheads of the assault, began to edge nearer to their jumping off positions. Army Group North was concentrated in East Prussia. Commanded by Field Marshal Wilhelm von Leib, Army Group North had 18th and 16th armies. Von Leib's armoured spearhead was General Herpner's Panzer Group 4. The infantry armies would field 20 divisions and the Panzer Group, three armoured and three motorised infantry divisions. The Finnish, Karelian and Southeastern armies would join the battle later, in loose cooperation with Army Group North. For air support, von Leib could call on the 1st Air Fleet. Army Group Center was deployed in Poland. Commanded by Field Marshal Fedor von Bock, Army Group Center had 9th and 4th armies. Its armoured forces were Hoth's Panzer Group 3 and Guderian's Panzer Group 2. The two infantry armies fielded 33 divisions and the Panzer Groups 9 armoured, 6 motorised and a cavalry division. Army Group Centre could call on 2nd Air Fleet for support. Army Group South was deployed in southern Poland and Romania. Commanded by Field Marshal Gert von Rundstedt, Army Group South had 6th and 17th Armies in Poland and 11th Army in Romania. Its armoured force was Kleist's Panzer Group 1. The infantry armies had 33 divisions and the Panzer Group 5 armoured and 3 motorised divisions. Supporting von Rundstedt would be two Romanian armies, the 3rd and 4th, one Hungarian and one Slovakian infantry corps, and an Italian motorised corps. The 4th Air Fleet would support ground operations. In the last fortnight before the German invasion, the pace of Soviet preparations for war accelerated dramatically. Although Stalin was still refusing to believe that the German danger was real, his commanders were forcing through precautionary measures wherever they could. 793,000 reservists were called up for training so at least some frontline units could be brought up to strength. The building of fortifications on the frontiers was stepped up, although to do so often meant stripping army divisions of transport, tractors and men. Anti-aircraft defences were also strengthened, although their crews were still under the strictest instructions not to open fire on German aircraft. Of total Soviet strength, 2,900,000 were deployed on the western frontiers, along with 15,000 tanks and 9,000 aircraft. More divisions were on their way. However, by the time of the German invasion, a full Soviet mobilization would not even have begun.
The Western Soviet Union was divided into four military areas. The Baltic, Western, Kiev and Odessa districts. After the start of the battle, these were reorganized and renamed fronts. The Northwest Front was commanded by Colonel General Fyodor Kuznetsov. Kuznetsov fielded 8th and 11th armies, with 27th Army in its second echelon. Altogether, Northwest Front had 28 rifle, 4 tank, and two motorized divisions. The West Front was commanded by General Dmitry Pavlov. West Front deployed 3rd, 10th and 4th armies, with 13th as a supreme command reserve. Altogether, 25 rifle and cavalry divisions, 13 tank and 7 motorized divisions. The Southwest Front was in the Ukraine and was commanded by Colonel General Mikhail Kerponos. Kerponos had 5th, 6th, 26th and 12th armies with 27 rifle and cavalry divisions, 12 tank and 6 motorized divisions. Bordering the Black Sea was the South Front commanded by General Ivan Tulenev. Tulenev had 9th and later 18th armies, with 17 rifle and cavalry divisions, 6 tank divisions and 3 motorized divisions. As well as the armies in place with the four Soviet fronts, another four armies, the 22nd, 19th, 21st and 16th, a total of 114 divisions were already under orders to move west. These would arrive after the start of the battle. Each of the fronts also had its own aviation component of bombers and fighters for support of ground operations. Starting at 3.15 on the morning of Sunday, June the 22nd, 1941, German guns opened up on one sector of the Soviet frontier after another. The salvos were carefully targeted. Communication centers, fuel and ammunition dumps, border defenses and barrack accommodation were all pounded without mercy. At hundreds of border posts, Soviet guards were killed without warning by specially trained assault troops who secured the bridges and crossing points. Far behind the beleaguered Soviet frontier units, German warplanes had appeared with the dawn. The first waves concentrated their destructive power on Red Army airfields. Most Russian aircraft were caught helpless on the ground. On the first day alone, the Luftwaffe would destroy more than 1400 Russian planes. As the hail of high explosives rained on the Soviet frontier defences and rear areas, Russian commanders frantically tried to interpret their instructions from Moscow. They had been warned not to react to provocations, but no one had told them how to tell a provocation from a full-scale attack. In a welter of confusion, orders were given and then countermanded. Many units received no orders at all. Key communication centers were out of action. Bombs.